Part four of The Willow Walk by Sinclair Lewis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Ferrard. Part four. The sharp pointed willow leaves had twisted and fallen after the dreary rains of October. Bark had peeled from the willow trunks, leaving gashes of bare wood that was a wet and sickly yellow. Through the denuded trees bulked the solid stone of John Holt's house. The patches of earth were greasy between the tawny knots of grass stems. The bricks of the walk were always damp now. The world was hunched up in this pervading chill. As melancholy as the sick earth seemed, the man who, in a slaty twilight, paced the willow walk, his step was slack, his lips moved with the intensity of his meditation over his wrinkled black suit and bleak shirt bosom was a worn overcoat the velvet collar turned green he was considering there's something to all this i begin to see i don't know what it is i do see but there's lights supernatural world that makes food and bed seem ridiculous i am i really am beyond the law i make my own law why shouldn't I go beyond the law of vision and see the secrets of life? But I send, and I must repent. Some day, I need not return the money. I see now that it was given me so that I could lead this life of contemplation. But the ingratitude to the president, to the people who trusted me, am I but the most miserable of sinners, and as the blind? Voices, I hear conflicting voices, some praising me for my courage, some rebuking he knelt on the slimy black surface of a wooden bench beneath the willows and as dusk clothed him round about he prayed it seemed to him that he prayed not in words but in vast confusing dreams the words of a language larger than human tongues when he had exhausted himself he slowly entered the house he locked the door there was nothing definite of which he was afraid but he was never comfortable with the door unlocked by candlelight he prepared his austere supper dry toast an egg cheap green tea with thin milk as always as it had happened after every meal now for eighteen months he wanted a cigarette when he had eaten but did not take one he paced into the living room and through the long still hours of the evening he read an ancient book all footnotes and cross-references about the numerology of the prophetic books and the number of the beast he tried to make notes for his own book and revelation that scant pile of sheets covered with writing in a small finicky hand thousands of other sheets he had covered through whole nights he had written but always he seemed with tardy pen to be racing after thoughts that he could never quite catch and most of what he had written he had savagely burned but some day he would make a masterpiece he was feeling toward the greatest discovery that mortal men had encountered everything he had determined was a symbol not just this holy sign and that but all physical manifestations with frightened exultation he tried his new power of divination the hanging lamp swung tenderly he ventured if the arc of that moving radiance touches the edge of the bookcase then it will be a sign that i am to go to south america under an entirely new disguise and spend my money he shuddered he watched the lamp's unbearably slow swing the moving light almost touched the bookcase he gasped then it receded it was a warning he quaked would he never leave this place of brooding and of fear which he had thought so clever a refuge he suddenly saw it all i ran away and hid in a prison man isn't caught by justice he catches himself again he tried he speculated as to whether the number of pencils on the table was greater or less than five if greater then he had sinned if less then he was veritably beyond the law he began to lift books and papers looking for pencils he was coldly sweating with the suspense of the test suddenly he cried am i going crazy he fled to his prosaic bedroom he could not sleep his brain was smouldering with confused inklings of mystic numbers and hidden warnings 
he woke from a half sleep more vision haunted than any waking thought and cried i must go back and confess but i can't i can't when i was too clever for them i can't go back and let them win i won't let those fools just sit tight and still catch me it was a year and a half since jasper had disappeared sometimes it seemed a month and a half sometimes gray centuries john's will-power had been shrouded with curious puttering studies long heavy breathing sittings with the ouija board on his lap midnight hours when he had fancied that tables had tapped and crackling coals had spoken now that the second autumn of his seclusion was creeping into winter he was conscious that he had not enough initiative to carry out his plans for going to south america the summer before he had boasted to himself that he would come out of hiding and go south leaving such a twisty trail as only he could make but oh it was too much trouble he hadn't the joy in play-acting which had carried his brother jasper through his preparations for flight he had killed jasper holt and for a miserable little pile of paper money he had become a mouldy recluse he hated his loneliness but still more did he hate his only companions the members of the sole hope fraternity that pious shrill seamstress that surly carpenter that tight-lipped housekeeper that old shouting man with the unseemly frieze of whiskers they were so unimaginative their meetings were all the same the same persons rose in the same order and made the same intimate announcements to the deity that they alone were his elect at first it had been an amusing triumph to be accepted as the most eloquent among them but that had become commonplace and he resented their daring to be familiar with him who was he felt the only man of all men living who beyond the illusions of the world saw the strange beatitude of higher souls it was at the end of november during a wednesday meeting at which a red-faced man had for a half hour maintained that he couldn't possibly send that the cumulative ennui burst in john holt's brain he sprang up he snarled you make me sick all of you you think you're so certain of sanctification that you can't do wrong so did i once now i know that we are all miserable sinners really are you all say you are but you don't believe it i tell you that you there that have just been yammering and you brother judkins with the long twitching nose and i i i most unhappy of men we must repent confess expiate our sins and i will confess right now i stole terrified he darted out of the hall and hatless coatless tumbled through the main street of rosebank not ceased till he had locked himself in his house he was frightened because he had almost betrayed his secret yet agonized because he had not gone on really confessed and gained the only peace he could ever know now the peace of punishment he never returned to soul hope hall indeed for a week he did not leave his house save for midnight prowling in the willow walk quite suddenly he became desperate with the silence he flung out of the house not stopping to lock or even close the front door he raced uptown no topcoat over his rotting garments only an old gardener's cap on his thick brown hair people stared at him he bore it with resigned fury he entered a lunchroom hoping to sit inconspicuously and hear men talking normally about him the attendant at the counter gaped john heard a mutter from the cashier's desk there's that crazy hermit all of the half-dozen young men loafing in the place were looking at him he was so uncomfortable that he could not eat even the milk and sandwich he had ordered he pushed them away and fled a failure in the first attempt to dine out that he had made in eighteen months a lamentable failure to revive that jasper holt whom he had coldly killed he entered a cigar store and bought a box of cigarettes he took joy out of throwing away his asceticism but when on the street he lighted a cigarette it made him so dizzy that he was afraid he was going to fall he had to sit down on the curb people gathered he staggered to his feet 
and up an alley for hours he walked making and discarding the most contradictory plans to go to the bank and confess to spend the money riotously and never confess it was midnight when he returned to his house before it he gasped the front door was open he chuckled with relief as he remembered that he had not closed it he sauntered in he was passing the door of the living-room going directly up to his bedroom when his foot struck an object the size of a book but hollow sounding he picked it up it was one of the book-like candy boxes and it was quite empty frightened he listened there was no sound he crept into the living-room and lighted the lamp the doors of the bookcase had been wrenched open every book had been pulled out on the floor all of the candy boxes which that evening had contained almost ninety six thousand dollars were in a pile and all of them were empty he searched for ten minutes but the only money he found was one five dollar bill which had fluttered under the table in his pocket he had one dollar and sixteen cents john holt had six dollars and sixteen cents no job no friends and no identity end of part four